Uh, hey students, so uh, there was, in one of my videos, I mentioned that I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about some of the statistical issues surrounding coronavirus because it is one of the things that has uh, greatly affected how our lives is uh, playing out and it's like I, I mean it is a disaster but amongst other things like from a scientific perspective it's extremely interesting so uh, and that includes statistics I would say that for me personally I find coronavirus uh, from a statistical perspective um, setting aside the disaster aspect of it for a second uh, rather interesting so um, uh, let's 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 start with this so what's part of the reason why coronavirus uh, is the disaster that it is uh, a lot of it has to do and a lot of the reason why is basically a statistical issue coronavirus uh, unlike the flu it's actually very hard to track so there's this article by um, one of my uh, preferred uh, uh, media outlets, Vox. Um, coronavirus is not the flu. It's worse. At all. It's also got a nice video where they're explaining some of the differences between coronavirus and the flu and what makes coronavirus the, the massive problem that it is in addition to it being a deadly virus, uh, much deadlier than the flu. Um, one of the problems with coronavirus is that unlike the flu, when you get the flu, it takes about a day for symptoms to develop after you catch it, which means that you are probably going to self-quarantine and stay away from people so that they don't catch it not long after you actually have it yourself and you're contagious. And coronavirus is not like that because coronavirus can take uh, a week or two before uh, symptoms develop when you've actually caught it. And in that time, in that two week time, you are contagious. So you're probably going to give it to a number of people. Uh, there's this number that people uh, have been citing called or not or something like that, which is talking about how many additional cases does an initial case of coronavirus create and, or, or actually not just coronavirus, but any disease. You can talk about the or not of, mo of many infectious diseases for the flu. I'm not sure if it's slightly below. I think it's slightly above one. Uh, and for coronavirus, it's, I think it's around one or two. It, it's much larger. It's like one or two. I think it's around two, um, which means that, so a flu case will, uh, one flu case will generate another flu ca case plus a little extra. Whereas coronavirus, they have this graphic in that article where it can be quite, or actually not in the article, but in the video, where it can be quite explosive. Um, and the number of cases ends up ballooning. And one of the reasons why that, that's the case is because of this, um, this uh, latency between having symptoms and being infectious. So what that means is that we actually don't know in the population how many people have the coronavirus unless we are testing uh comprehensively i've actually got in my window manager that hopefully you're able to see uh right here is a little coronavirus uh applet tracker that i added um there's this uh, guy who makes uh youtube videos on uh technology named luke smith and he showed me how to do it um in his in one of his videos um he's got great tech videos and i'll just i'll just leave it at that his his tech videos are very good um some of the other stuff is like, I'll watch it, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Anyway, um, so, um, um, so this number right here is, I believe, an official number uh, updated like every 12 hours or something from some source. Uh, this is the official number of detected coronavirus cases well, this is active cases in the state of Utah. This is the number of deaths uh, attributed to coronavirus in the state of Utah. Um, so these numbers are actually very closely tied to testing regime, to how, how much testing is being done. And different testing regimes can lead to uh, 
the coronavirus appearing very differently if those are the only numbers that you're paying attention to. So there's this guy named Nate Silver who, I mean, if you're into politics and you're into stats, uh, you definitely should be paying attention to Nate Silver. I've been aware of Nate Silver. I think I got some awareness of him in 2008 and 2010, and I was definitely aware of him in 2012 during the 2012 election. I've been uh, following him very closely ever since, and I read his book. It's an excellent book called uh, The Signal and the Noise. Uh, so uh, he has been saying that uh, he, he came up with this example, and I think at the very bottom of this article, uh, he has an Excel spreadsheet that if you're if you want, you can play around with. Um, and uh, he comes up with different scenarios to drive home the point that if all you're doing is paying attention to the official case counts um, and uh, detected cases, then you can see just about any shape you want in coronavirus numbers. So and he comes up with four different scenarios. And the, this uh, bluish greenish line is always the same in these scenarios. Uh, it's always corresponding to the actual number of coronavirus cases, whereas this uh, pinkish reddish line uh, is the detected cases. So in this scenario, there's robust testing. And um, my understanding of it is that uh, people get tested when they have symptoms. I'm not thinking that this is a scenario where literally everyone gets tested all the time, whether you have symptoms or not. I would call that comprehensive testing. And uh, the United States is nowhere near that. I think South Korea is, I think that might be what South Korea is doing, um, but don't quote me on that. So um, in this situation, there is going to be a lag. So it looks like the coronavirus has peaked when actually uh, we're, quite a, in, we're actually quite a ways from the peak. Um, because people don't get tested until they exhibit symptoms. So anyone here can get a test if they want. There's no restriction on the number of tests, but you don't actually, but pe but you don't actually force people to get tested whether they have symptoms or not. Um, and you end up with something that is actually somewhat representative of the overall coronavirus curve. Um, so that's one scenario. It's a more ideal scenario. Uh, the perfect scenario in this case would be complete comprehensive testing. Um, he comes up with a second scenario um, where you have a sudden one-time increase in testing where the country is not at all prepared uh, for coronavirus. And then they're like, oh my gosh, this thing is a thing now. And they suddenly make a whole bunch of tests. And if, if you don't actually see the blue line, remember, in these scenarios, you don't actually get to see the blue line. So the pink line makes it look like there's actually a dramatic increase in coronavirus cases where the coronavirus cases in the country, the actual cases, is the same. And that's because of how testing was being done. It was, it's, it's because there was a sudden dramatic increase in testing, and that produces a sudden increase in detected cases. Uh, another case is where you have a high test floor but a low test ceiling, where there's a lot of initial testing, but you can still end up with a testing shortage because you don't make a lot more tests to cover all of the cases that are coming in. And in this scenario, again, remember, this bluish line is the same, but it looks like there's a less dramatic increase and it looks like the coronavirus situation is actually not as bad as in one of, as in like this situation right here. And that's, again, due exclusively to how testing is being done. Um, it looks like you never actually, like, it looks like there's going to be fewer cases when actually the case count ends up being the same. Uh, and if you, let's say that this government um, is actually... Uh, quite pathological and really does not want to get blamed. It, it doesn't want people thinking about coronavirus and it wants to portray itself as handling coronavirus very well. There is actually a very easy way to do that if you're a government, which is to decrease testing. And if you're decreasing testing, and this is something that you could see in some of these more authoritarian countries, um, it can actually look like you've got a great handle on the coronavirus situation when actually the coronavirus situation is actually the same. So in this situation, you never detect the peak in coronavirus uh, cases. And in fact, it looks like you start uh, decreasing cases quite rapidly and there's fewer cases. And it's not because your country wasn't hit hard. This, this is exactly the same scenario as the other countries. It's exclusively because of how testing was being done. 
and it's exclusively because we decided we're going to decrease tests in order to decrease detected coronavirus cases and pretend that there isn't a problem. So, yeah, this, it's, so basically this number right here, his point right here is that if you don't know how testing is being done, you basically know nothing about the virus. Nothing at all. Uh, it, unless you have, the only way you can really know for sure how many people in the country have coronavirus because of this latency between uh, symptoms. Oh, it looks like uh, uh, something froze. Uh, let's restart that. Okay. Okay. So because of this uh, latency, um, this especially strong latency, like the day between getting the flu and exhibiting symptoms for the flu is about a day. For coronavirus, it's a week or two. Because of that uh, discrepancy, testing pretty much dictates what the, the virus or the epidemic looks like. So, um, so you basically know nothing without the, without the testing. So uh, now getting to more of the statistics, because as he points out in this, this is not a model in the way statisticians talk about models. This is basically just arithmetic. Um, there's no real model here. Uh, so uh, getting more to the statistical issues involving uh, coronavirus. So in the video that I'm kind of that kind of linked to this, I was discussing uh, issues such as convenience sampling. And convenience sampling is when uh, the person conducting the study is collecting a sample based mostly on its availability um, and how easily that sample can be obtained as opposed to uh, doing a more rigorous procedure where uh, they are uh, doing random sampling or even stratified random sampling, something like that. Um, is this a situation of convenience uh, sampling? Well, no. It is not real. That, that's not really what's going on. And the reason why is because there is no sampling. There's no sampling going on. This number right here, there's no sampling involved in this. This is how many people who were uh, given a test for detecting coronavirus actually came up positive. The, it's, the, it's the population number, essentially. So there is no testing. Uh, there is no sampling to speak of. And the same thing goes with selection bias to some degree. Uh, so I didn't talk about selection bias in that video, but this is something that if you ever take an econometrics class, they will talk about selection bias a lot. So selection bias is a phenomenon where the individuals, whether an individual appears in your study or appears in a sample, um, ha is re related to uh, their characteristics. Whether they appear in a population is related to their characteristics. So uh, that means that... Um, there's a there is a potential to um where if you're like there there is some uh, potential for those characteristics that you don't actually observe uh to confound your results um this isn't really a selection bias problem either uh because again that's how many people who were given a test came up positive for coronavirus uh there is a little bit of a selection bias well, I don't know. I actually kind of just think that selection bias isn't really the issue. Um, essentially, the problem there there is in a, there is a sense where uh, convenience sampling selection bias rhymes with this issue that I was talking about with coronavirus, uh, and kind of the common denominator amongst these three things is confounding variables, where there is essentially a variable that you want or or some parameter or some statistic that you want to know, um, some question that you want to have answered, and you have a statistic, but that statistic cannot answer that question because there are other factors at play. So I would say that that is kind of the underlying issue. Um, uh, that, that, is, that is kind of the thing that, ha that these three issues have in common. There is a confounding variable in all three of them. In the case of convenience sampling, the confounding variable is how is the availability of um, the sample based on whoever is conducting the study. Um, selection bias, the confounding variable, is whether someone actually appears in the study or not. 
um, because that or because there's characteristics that cause them to appear in a study or not. Um, and in this case, the confounding variable is testing. So, um, as, as so, stepping aside for a second, this reminds me. Uh, this reminds me a lot of um, when I was working on my undergraduate thesis, my honors thesis, and that was an economics paper. Uh, and I was studying the gender gap in wages, and I was working with a man named uh, Jihan Bilgensoy. And there was one day I was talking with Jihan, and there's this number that's often cited in these gender gap studies, or whenever anyone wants to talk about the gender gap, and it's going to be the ratio between women's median wages and men's median wages. So you'll hear people say, like, women make 86 cents for every dollar a man makes, and that's basically that number, uh, the ratio between men's and women's median wages. Um, I actually have a talk. Uh, I, I gave a talk for this uh, um, group called uh, Women in Architecture, and uh, it was at this uh, event called Pecha Kucha Night, and uh, I actually have a video of that on YouTube, and on YouTube I will link to it uh, if you're at all interested in, in, in that issue. But I was talking with Jihan one day, and I said this about that ratio, th that, that common gender gap number, the ratio between men's and women's wages. Uh, I said, this is not a good statistic. Um, it's not a good measure. And his response to, th or it's not a good measure of, uh, of uh, well, I think I, all I just said was it's not a good measure. And his response to that was basically, no, no, no. It, it, a measure just measures. Like saying that the gender gap is a bad measure is like saying that the temperature is a bad measure when it's not a bad measure, it's just a measure, right? Measures can't be bad. They just are what they are. Like, they can be bad in the sense that they're literally inaccurate, where, like, you like you slap down a ruler or something, and you just, like, throw your finger somewhere on the ruler, and... Oh, it looks like it did it again. Um, uh, oops. Uh, where are you, uh, like, like, you can be inaccurate in your measurement, and that's a different issue, but if the measurement itself is accurate, then the measurement cannot be bad, it is just a measurement. And that kind of stuck with me, uh, this idea that the measure itself cannot be bad, because I had a point, and he also had a point. It's just, I didn't phrase it quite right when I was talking about the gender gap, because when it came to the gender gap, what I wanted to say, what I actually wanted to say is, this is not a good measure for whether people are being discriminated against. Because what people want to say when they're talking about those gender gap numbers is, okay, women make 80 cents for every dollar a man makes, or the, the number is different now, um, but women make 80 cents for every dollar a man makes. Uh, so women are being paid unfairly and men are, or employers, not necessarily men because women can do it too. Employers are not paying women what they should be fairly paid. And... Um, they're basically discriminating against it. They're, it's like, literally, you're a man, you're a woman, I'm going to pay the woman less, right? And the typical gender gap numbers in this 80 cents on the dollar measure, it does not say that that's what's going on because you can say that there are other issues that could come into play, such as what jobs do men and women have? If men have higher paying jobs than women do, um, then uh, that's coming into play. Like jobs that would pay both men and women less because it's just a lower paying job. If fewer women are in the workforce, if they have, um, uh, if they have less experience, there's like a whole laundry list of factors that you could list out as possible explanations uh, that are not um, literally or, or or that are not di directly discriminatory um, that could potentially explain that gap. I mean, whether it's some other form of discrimination, we can start talking about that, but. Um, you can list out this laundry list of reasons. Um, so basically those, those, uh, I did it again. Why is it doing this? <laughs> um, so those, uh, gender gap numbers, that gender gap number just basic. it's, it's not a bad measure because that is the difference between men's and women's wages. It just doesn't say what we want to say which is whether how much women are being paid less than men because women are women and men are men and people are not fair, right? Is 
that is what we actually want to say, and the ratio between men's and women's wa wages, this raw ratio, does not tell us that. And this is actually a similar issue to that, where we have a number right here that isn't estimated at all. This is the official number. This is an accurate number. This is a population statistic. God damn it. <laughs> uh, I, I think I might just give up on that. All right. I, I'm, I'm, I'm done with that. Um, we have this number... Uh, uh, this uh, this uh, ca this ca official case count number, and this number is true. This number is literally true. It cannot be a bad number. This is how many people we have detected have coronavirus. The problem is it doesn't tell us what we actually want to know, which is how many people have coronavirus. This number does not tell us that. This number tells us how many people we've detected have coronavirus. And that's kind of the discrepancy. That's the statistical issue. How would we go from a number like this, where you have a confounding variable, which is the degree of testing, how would you go from that to uh, saying what you actually want to say, which is how many people in the country have coronavirus? And people have, it, it's it's that is the statistical issue, and that's the hard problem. Because... Yeah, you, you don't actually know that number. You have to somehow account for testing. Or I, I I remember at one point, some statisticians, I was reading a bunch of archive papers that were coming out um, on uh, on a trying to determine how many people uh, have the disease. And, um, and they were coming, like some strategies were uh, saying uh, the death count is actually very accurate. It's easy to tell. When someone died because of coronavirus, they probably were positively identified with the coronavirus. So we should be using the death count and then some sort of SIR model to infer how many people, uh, excuse me, uh, how many people have the disease, um, which was an interesting idea. And, and it's an interesting idea. And unfortunately, it doesn't work because uh, like we had this like New York was absolutely macabre and. Uh, we had a situation in New York where people were like the, the, the outbreak was so bad that people were dying in their homes, probably from the disease, and they never got the opportunity to be tested. So the state of New York actually had to go back in time and say this was probably a coronavirus death. So we're going to add that to the death counts. So that means that even the deaths are not accurately known. Um, so... Um, so, yeah, it, it, at, at the end of the day, if you wanted to try to estimate how many people are going or actually have the disease, the disease, this isn't even about how many people are going to get it. It's about how many people right now have it. If you're going to try uh, to come up with a number like that, you have to use some sort of modeling framework or you have to do comprehensive testing. Um, a comprehensive testing, like the statisticians will be much more satisfied with a comprehensive testing answer um, because there's no like models are always uncertain and comprehensive testing is completely uncertain because everyone got tested regularly uh, on a regular basis. So you now really know who has and who doesn't without that, you have to rely on some sort of model to try to account for that confounding variable of, um, uh, um, the, of, of testing. So, so, um, so yeah, I think one thing, so two takeaways from this if you're a stats student. First off, there's this data quality issue. Um, and this is somewhat of a data quality issue uh, and uh, like whether the data is of good quality. And in, in the case of coronavirus case counts, uh, it's not of good quality in the sense that we it's not because of this confounding issue of uh, the degree of testing. Uh, you don't actually have an accurate picture of... Um, how many people have the, the virus. There's this confounding variables issue, which is actually, this is an underlying theme in a lot of statistics. Uh, confounding variables, if you're gonna keep working with statistics, you need to be thinking about confounding variables. And that explains why a lot of things are the way they are. It's the reason why simple random sampling is the sampling procedure that's very popular. It's the reason why we have uh, blind and double blind uh, medical studies uh, it's to remove confounding variables, which are variables that you don't necessarily observe, but are still influencing 
the outcomes of your analysis. Um, so confounding variables as like as starting stat students, that's something to be really thinking about. And also finally, the issue of is the variable that you're um, trying, like thinking about seriously, what is it that you're actually trying to detect? What variables are you actually interested in? Uh, what, stat what statistics in a sense are you actually interested in? In this case, the problem is we do not care about detected coronavirus cases. What we want to know about is coronavirus cases, period. Like all coronavirus cases detected or not. And this number does not give us that. Okay. So that's a, that, that kind of falls into thinking about your problem and thinking about it in a fairly rigorous sort of way um, where you're actually thinking about what is it that I actually want to know about and not just um, what what is available to me. Okay. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, and uh, yeah, this is I am not an expert in epidemiology, by the way. I should probably mention that. Uh, but there are some things that, as someone who studies statistics, I can say. So I'm coming at this from a statistic, a statistician, a, a generic statistician's perspective, also more of an econometrician's perspective, because I do have some experience. Econometrics is more my area of study. Uh, so I have some. So as an econometrician, there are some things I can say, but I will just preface that by saying I, like I, I, biology was hard for me. So I'm not an epidemiologist, but. I think there are some things that I can say, and hopefully you learned something from this. Okay, so I'll hopefully see you in some future videos. And uh, and yeah, th this will probably be not the last of these sides. Um, and uh, have a good day.